Are you ready for the word? Yeah. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come together to worship you, to celebrate you, to receive from you. As we look into the word, I thank you that it is, according to your word, the perfect law of liberty. It is a place of freedom. It is this place of freedom. So as the word goes forth today, Father God, we curse and bind the challenges of the enemy, the tactics of the enemy, the devices, any demonic power, influence, anything that would be a, a hesitant, a delay, anything that would be in combat with your will, we subdue it under the authority of the name of Jesus. And I speak into the lives of your people, uh, complete and total freedom, for whom the Son is set free, is free indeed in every area of their life, spiritually, emotionally, physically. And we give you praise, and everybody shouted, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we've been, during the summer, going through and reading the Bible together and then exhorting on different verses from what we read. But if you have your Bible, let's jump into Ephesians chapter 4. We're going into the chap fourth chapter today. Have you been enjoying this process? Instead of doing a series or title, just kind of line upon line. And hopefully you kind of, as we're going through this book, amen? Four of you, thank you. I like you for the best. The rest of you, you're on your own. If you don't have your Bible, you can look on the screen or download the Bible app. Ephesians chapter 4, let's, New Living Translation. Let's read this together. One, two, three. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Give yourself a hand clap. You did a fantastic job. You know, the Olympics just started. I don't know if you're into it or watch it. I kind of like watching all the different and see who, what medals are going to be won in gold, silver, bronze. Watched a lady who was, uh, was literally at tears because her whole life she wanted to re win the gold, and yet she won the bronze. And you would think, well, at least you won something. But what a passion for victory. What a passion and drive to succeed. Paul tells us that we're to run the race as to win. Run the race as to win. Not run it in a way that it's a casual. You know, casual athletes or weekend warriors usually never win big contests in a game of sports. Can I get an amen? That makes sense, right? If you're like, oh, I'm going to play basketball, I'm going to be in the Olympics for whatever sport it might be, and you say, man, how many hours a day do you train? Oh, not much. Just when I get time. When my, when my calendar allows it. All of a sudden, it's a change in, in, in perspective because you can look at that person saying, you might think you're going to win, but in reality, you won't win. Why? Because we, they're not taking it seriously. There's not a drive to win. Paul starts off in this, in this verse to, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, prisoner serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Part of that emphasis I'm going to draw to real quickly is that each and every one of us, he's talking to the church individually and globally, but to each one of us here today, that you are called of God. Say, I'm called of God. Come on, shout, I am called of God. It's interesting how things evolve in thoughts and ideas, especially even in the church world. And we get to the mindset, if we're not careful, that only full-time ministers are called of God. And if someone says, you're called of God, you can say, wait a minute, I'm not a pastor, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not an apostle or prophet or teacher. No, no, that's, it didn't say you were called necessarily to full-time ministry. But your life is called by God to make a difference. You ask some people that come in and out of church every week or every other week or every three or four weeks, and you ask them where they're at in their internal walk with God, and if they're saying, you know, it, it, sometimes good, sometimes bad, most of those people, if you do an honest poll with them, will tell you that they don't really feel that they are here for a reason, that they're called of God. They think there's other people called of God. They think there's other people that God wants to do something. But for them, they're just kind of going through the motion. They're just going through the routine. 
And one of the things that will help in our Christian life is when we realize that you're not overlooked. You're not forgotten. Maybe some of us feel like David, who his father sent out to work with a few sheep, the Bible tells us. Being a shepherd was not an important job. It was the job you give the, the littlest, the youngest. And so here David's doing the job that nobody else wants. It's the one on the, the to- least of the totem pole pecking order. It's like getting into a, a new job, and they say, this is the worst job, but you're the newest one, so you're at the bottom. you got to work your way up. So he was at the worst of the worst of jobs, and he only had a few sheep. And yet, when the prophet said, where are your sons? God sent me to anoint one of them to be king, he was overlooked. He brought all his sons out except for David. And one by one, the prophet would stand in front of him and say, nope, nope. And at one time, he was like, oh, this must be the one. And God said, nope, not that one. I'm telling you, you might feel overlooked. You might feel isolated and by yourself. You might feel like an island to yourself in the routine of life. You might feel like no one's ever helped you or given you a a lift up out of a pit or helped you move to the next level. But I'm here to tell you that when you take what God's called in your life seriously, that if everybody's against you and God is for you, your best days are still yet ahead. Can I get an amen? Because God will move upon the people like the prophet and say, wait a minute, is there not? He asked the question, is there not anybody else? Boy, talk about an awkward question. When the prophet comes and says, are you lying to me, basically? Have you ever had a moment when someone said, are you lying to me? And you weren't being... Totally, you weren't lying, but you weren't being totally honest, however that works. And he's like, well, I do have one more son, but he's out there with the sheep. And the prophet said, we'll not eat until I see him, send somebody to go get him. We'll not move forward to this day. And when David began to show up, I know they, they probably thought this is a waste of time. Prophet, you've missed it now. You've just gone through the best and the one who's most qualified and you're, you're really, you were scraping the bottom of the barrel with David. Wait till you see him. He, you know what I mean? He's, a, he's small, he's redheaded. He's, you know what I mean? He is not, he is not gonna, you laugh, but the, in one translation says that he was ready, which means redheaded. Did you realize that? Hmm. You probably think, oh, he's not, he doesn't look like us. He doesn't act like us. He's not really one of us. He's an outcast. Some theologians believe that he was a product of an affair because David penned, I was conceived in iniquity, which may or may not be true, I don't know, but would explain the natural reason when the prophet shows up why they tried to hide David in the field. So you can only imagine the brothers talking and saying, oh, this this prophet has missed the mark. He is not going to make it. He's, gonna, he's gone to the wrong family, or he, it, it should have been me. And all of a sudden, when David shows up, God speaks to the prophet Samuel and says, that's the one anoint him. I'm telling you, the, the favor of God, the favor of God, when you begin to take the serious what God's called you to do, and it doesn't mean full-time ministry, it's beginning to look at life and saying, I'm not going to be flippant with life. I'm not going to say one day I'll start serving you. I'm going to take what you want me to do serious. I'm going to begin to read the Bible. I'm going to begin to pray. I'm going to begin to serve you. I'm going to begin to look for your direction. I'm going to begin to obey you because obedience is better than sacrifice. And begin to look at, it doesn't mean you're coming under bondage. It's that you are valuing the word of God and God's impact in your life and your relationship with Jesus above all things. We, can't, we gotta move out of the phase. I don't know who I'm talking to, but we gotta move out of the phase of we just go with the flow. And if they want us to do things that we know that's not right, well, that's okay, I'll do it this weekend, and I know it's sin and it's wrong, but I'll go to church Sunday and repent. And it, no, you, it, can you imagine a professional athlete treating life that way in their career? They wouldn't do that. You would say, hey, you want some, you want some chocolate and some ice cream? And they're like, no, I'm in training. Only in the church world do we realize and act and we treat our Christian walk like it's the least important thing and the last thing we get to. And we'll get to it whenever. And then we expect God to make us a priority. 
We treat him like he's not important and he's, he's, it doesn't matter if, if we obey him. And then we run into a problem and we're crying, oh God, where are you? Why did you let this happen? And God didn't let it happen. God didn't make it happen. God didn't send that evil to you. He doesn't send evil to teach you stuff. It's interesting to me. And I want to encourage you. I believe there's a favor coming on your life. That as you begin to, as you be, not, not for everybody, because some people are just like, yeah, whatever, let me get out of here so I can mark on my checklist that I did this and I don't have to think about God for another month. But between you, it's between you and Jesus. We're not here to force you. But to those who are like, I am ready to walk this thing. I'm ready to make this real. I'm ready to move past the, the shadows and the fake it till you make it and the smoke and mirrors and be real with my heart and God. And it doesn't mean you have to talk weird. It doesn't mean you have to imitate somebody. But you know between you and God and your heart if it's real or not. And when you begin to say, Lord, I'm going to begin to serve you with all of my heart. Wasn't that the commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And to love your neighbors yourself. And when you're like, Lord, I'm not going to be perfect. I know I'm going to mess up and I don't know everything. But God, I'm giving you my heart. I'm going to do this with all my heart. I'm taking in this series, and I'm telling you, when you begin to have that mindset, get ready, the favor of God's coming on your life, and what enemy tried to stop you, what people try to forget about you and overlook you and won't promote you, God has a way to move you through destiny. Can I get an amen? He goes on to say, be patient, be patient, always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. I want to talk today, next few minutes, about the benefit of being a part of the church. One of the things that's happened, and I'm just going to be transparent with you, When the pandemic happened and people started shutting churches down, pastors began to figure out what they needed to do. And some of them have taken, many of them actually, have taken the position and they would preach it and teach it and shout it from the rooftops and get people to watch online. And I'm not against online for many of you who are watching or watching on later. But they begin to sell the idea. And that's what they were doing. They were selling an idea. And at first glance, it almost sounds right, but you're going to see that the subtle tactic of the enemy. They begin to shout from the rooftops, the church is more than a building. You don't need to come to a building to be part of a church. The church is more than a building. I want to say to that, okay, the church is more than a car. What's that got to do with anything? And I know the reality is what they were saying is we can still be the church even though we don't see each other and come together and worship together. And on first glance, that sounds right. Oh, because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost individually, the Bible says, but also corporately. It's getting quiet. And so this, has anybody heard that? Oh, we don't have, you can just watch online. It's all, we're, right? The church is more than a building. And it sounds right. And if you, if you shut the doors and told people they can't come, their logic is we've got to keep people connected somehow. Otherwise, we'll wake up when we open the doors and they'll have gone down somewhere else or have nobody. And what happened for a lot of churches is they opened the doors and they have so sold an idea that really is out of context, and I'll show you why. That all of a sudden when they open the doors that you've already told everybody they don't really need to come to church. Now you know what they're trying to do. They're having to go through a whole series of, the, of why you should come to church. They got caught. Is the church more than a building? Yes. I'm not saying the church is based on a building. But the, that's not the argument. That's not the point. The point is not the building. The point is the community. Yes. God knew that there would be benefits needed for you 
and I in this context of an idea that he created for the last days that started in Acts called the local church. Now, sure, humanity gets in there. You can say man or, man or woman, women or men or humanity gets their hands in stuff, and boy, we can mess things up. And you get all these religions and denominations and all this other stuff. And that's why I commonly say I'm into a relationship, not a religion. Right. Meaning that we're not into, because a lot of people know everything that the doctrine of their church, this is what my church believes. Well, what does the Bible say? Well, I don't know what the Bible says, but this is what my church says. Come on, come on. If it's not in the Bible, we follow what the Bible says. Right. Yeah. Amen. It's a real relationship. Convictions that are developed out of the Word of God by the Spirit of God in your own life. Not, not copying other people. It's a relationship. Say it's a relationship. It's a relationship. And so we look at the situation and we say, wait a minute. It, the church is not a building. I, I give it that. But the church is a community. Yes. It's more than an organization. It's a living organism. Amen. It's an ideal from heaven for the New Testament the new covenant church to do and carry out the assignment of heaven on earth. Amen. But I'm going to go over these a couple of verses and just give you a few benefits. And we'll, we're going to move through them quickly in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 10, Amplified Translation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says, And let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to do good deeds, not forsaking our meeting together, as believers, for worship and instruction, as it is the habit of some. Now, I want you to notice, even in the church, when, when this was being written long, long time ago, to the church, notice this. He's saying, don't forsake the meeting together. King James says the assembly, the gathering. Don't forsake are meeting together as believers for worship and instruction as the habit of some. Which means in that time, there's people walking around saying, oh, I don't need to be part of a church. I could be an island to myself, just me and Jesus. Just me and Jesus, that's all I need, just me and Jesus. Well, there's something that God finds is important for you to be a part of, a church. There's a reason, there's a benefit. Oh, no, I just, me and Jesus, I'll pray and I'll read my Bible, just me and Jesus. Well, the church is part of the body of Christ, so if you want to be you and Jesus, guess what? you got to find this connection. For worship and instruction, as some habits are, but encourage one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. As we get closer to the return of Jesus, not to go in the last day's teaching, which we've done around here, as we get closer to the last days, it does get darker. It does become more evil. But that's when our light needs to shine brighter. And when it seems like the opposition against the gospel gets strongest, that's not the time to retreat. Did you hear me, church? That's not the time to pack it up. That's not time to go on vacation. That's not time to say, we'll wait this one out and then we'll try and reach some people later. No, he's saying as the day gets closer, do what? We're supposed to be gathering more often. There's, a, there's some reason. There's some benefits there. Number one, when we gather together, just from this verse, we find that there's encouragement. Let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another. Have you ever tried encouraging yourself? That's tough to do unless you do it like David did in the Lord, which means you do it through prayer and worship and praise. But a lot of times if you try to encourage yourself, no, in the local church, not, not every church is going to have this. But I know and believe that we have that here at Hope Church. Can I get an amen? You're going to find relationships that encourage you, not discourage you. You're to be encouraged, 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 encouraged. You know, when you start... When you start browbeating people, you're not encouraging them, you're discouraging them. 
If you walk out of church, you, I remember years ago, and this was old school. Some of you might remember this, that they, they didn't think the preacher was preaching good until he called them out, had them stained up, ripped on them, told them why they're going to hell, and I mean, told their business, and oh, that was good. Woo, tore me up. That was good church. I remember those days. But that's, you know, the Bible says that we're to be encouraged to do good. Yes. See, I believe when you walk out of the house of God, worshiping the Lord together, spending time in the Word together, spending time with each other, that when you walk away, you should be more encouraged. You should be more encouraged than you were before. You shouldn't walk out of there and going, man, I got to go find something to pick me up because I've been in church all day and I'm just feeling horrible about life. I'm feeling horrible about everything. My, I don't see any hope. No, no. And a thousand times, no. You should walk away feeling encouraged. You should be excited. You should, your hope should be elevated. Your faith should be stronger. You should walk out and say, where are you, devil? Because I'm going to tear into you this week. You should walk in and say, oh, things are going to change. I don't have to live the way I have been living. I have another level. I have another opportunity. I have another blessing. I have a miracle that's waiting for me. I'm going to turn toward my miracle this week in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen? amen. Say, I'm encouraged. Amen. Number two, it says encourage one another to love. That's a, the love of God. Experiencing God's love and, and loving people. And have you been around church long enough to know that not all church people are lovable? Come on, somebody. Let's get real with it. Not all church. Well, I went to church one day and they weren't nice to me. Well, that's, they were wrong, but don't, don't blame Jesus for them. Hear about the, guy, about the guy who was drugged to church by his wife. Never wanted to go. And finally he said, I'm, oh, all right, I'll go, because she just wouldn't stop. And on the way, he dropped her off and went and parked the car. And on the way into the building, he ran at the door of another guy who was totally rude. And he thought, these church people. And he kind of looked at him and gave him a rude comment back. Not knowing that the guy he just passed was another guy who was drugged to church by his wife. And forgot something in the car and walked out to the car to get something. But the devil made sure they ran into each other. And they're all blaming the church and blaming Jesus. You know, church people not, are not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Only Jesus. And not everybody's going to be lovable all the time. It's kind of like we're in our own little laboratory, are we not? Because Jesus said, if you love only the people that love you, you're just like the world. Try, try, try another level of love. Try another level of love. You say there's another level of love? Absolutely. It's called the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit of God. What kind of love is that? That's, that comes from the grace of God that allows you to love people. That's not a warm and fuzzy. See, you're working for, you're looking for a warm and fuzzy towards somebody. It's not a warm and fuzzy. It's not a, it's not a, oh, I feel so warm and comfortable. You might not ever feel warm and comfortable, but you love them. You do good for them. Even at your cost. It's the love of God. Jesus said, if you love everybody who loves you, you're just like the world. But if you love people who don't love you, you go. so sometimes we deal with that in the church. It's a good laboratory experiment. Yep. But also you'll find that people will love you even when you're unlovable. Yeah. And that's when it gets real. Yeah. Encouragement, love. Number three, it says to love and to do good deeds. We're to encourage each other to make a difference. You don't, a church is just not a place to show up on Sunday. It's a relationship, a community. And in that community, you're not only going to make friends, you're not only going to experience God, but you're also, the goal is to make a difference in the lives of people. I love to see our, our what we call small groups, and they, they can be Bible studies, but they can also be outreach groups. They could be fellowship groups. But I love seeing on, on Facebook pictures of, of groups that maybe are going out and they're going into the inner city or they're going to places and take food to the homeless or they're handing out food or we're doing different outreaches. It's great to see impact happening. And then to see over the process of time in that impact because you have a passion. Man, I, I have a passion to help these type of people. I have a passion to go to retirement homes and, and to preach and feed and encourage them. I have, and we do that too. 
I see Stan and Tammy sitting there who are one of our leaders who go into retirement homes. Amen. And they take them food, and they love them, and they minister to them. You know, Jesus talked about helping the orphans and the widows. We take that seriously. But then I, besides that, I love seeing impact happening. But then besides that, I love seeing all of a sudden those who were doing ministry together now spending time together at a restaurant or hanging out or getting to know each other. What's happening? They're developing a relationship. They have a common bond to make a difference. And maybe you're like, well, I, I'm not into feeding people. Well, that's okay. What are you into? What, what has God called you to do? Because as you're doing it, guess what? You're going to find that connection, that, that community. And then you get that encouragement and that benefit of not only helping somebody, but helping people that have the same passion to help other people too. Amen. Encouragement, love, do good. Notice this. Not forsaking our meeting together as believers. Part of that community is we come together to worship the Lord. You might say, but pastor, I can worship the Lord by myself. And you can. And you should. But listen to me, church. There is something different. There's something special. When people come together to worship the Lord. This is, not a, this is not trying to build a, be a crowd builder. What you have to, this is not trying to build a crowd. What you have to understand, that there is biblical something in the realm of the Spirit that is different when we come to worship the Lord. Amen. Not come just to be a spectator. Right. And if you're a spectator, we love you, and you're welcome to be a spectator. But I'm telling you, you can sit on the bank of the water and watch everybody enjoy it and be hot and sweaty and say, man, I wish it would cool down. Or you can step into the joy of the water and cool down yourself and it'd be refreshed in what God has for you that he's pouring out today. Can I get an amen? amen? There's something the Bible talks about that is different when we come together. I want you to understand that. I want you to know that because I want you to expect that when you walk into the house of God with other believers, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. The Bible says that when you pray in agreement touching one thing, it shall be done. That's a power, that's a power of agreement. The Bible says if one will put a thousand, two will put ten thousand. That's not increase, that's an exponential increase. What is the, what am I telling you? There is an exponential authority, an exponential anointing, an exponential power, an exponential truth available to you when you come together with other believers expecting and say, Lord, I've been studying this on my own and I'm looking for revelation and God, I believe when I come into the house of God, you're going to speak to me, you're going to open your word to me, you're going to impact my life and you can experience something from God that you might not ever be able to do it on your own as an island to yourself. Why? Because God is called us to be part of his body. Amen. Worship the Lord together. Notice not only says in this translation, not forsaking our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction. Yes. And instruction. Not to browbeat, but to give instruction. Amen. Not to diminish, but to encourage. Amen. I love it when the anointing is flowing. I could be, even if I'm not preaching, I'm sitting in meetings and I've seen the Spirit of God do it this way. And as I begin to, in my own time, pray and prepare my heart, my spirit for the Word of God, all of a sudden I have noticed that the Spirit of God can begin to unfold and make the Word give me understanding on the Scripture, sometimes literally as the minister is saying it. Why? Because something is special when we come together. Not only to worship, but also to receive instruction. Listen, that, let me just bring balance to this. When you receive instruction, that doesn't mean that Pastor Greg is your Jesus. See, some people have taken that too so far that it's like, if you want to do anything, you got to get the approval of the pastor. No. I'm not your Jesus. I'm not going to call you on Thursday and say, what have you been doing? That's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Do you see that? I don't have a computer program fast enough to keep track of every person and what they're doing and what they're saying and where they're going. You want to live in sin? Live in sin, but it's your cost to yourself, not me. I tell people, if you want to go to hell, you're welcome to go to hell. We'll love you all the way. 
I'm not going to try. I'm not going to hell to stop you. Jesus went to hell to pay for the price. I can't do any more than that. You know what I mean? It's your choice. Now, you might think that's wrong, but that's that's just who I am. Unless, Unless the Holy Spirit tells me to do it differently, that's just what I'm doing. I give you the freedom to make a choice where you want to live at the level of life that God has for you. For Jesus said, I've come in John 10, 10, that you might have life and life more abundantly. That's in the Greek is zoe, which means the quality of life that God has. And you can choose at what level you want to have that life. You can wait to get to heaven to begin to experience it, or you can be like the understanding of Jesus told the disciples, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's levels of life. You can choose at what level, and you can stop at any level. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Until you say it is enough. Camp out where you want to camp out. But don't, don't be a hindrance to those who are like, this is great, but I know God has more in store. Yeah. I want to reach more. I yeah. want to help more. I want to, I want to love more. I want to do more. I want to have more. I want to, I want to fulfill destiny. That's okay, too. Encourage them. Amen. Don't discourage them. Some people discourage them because it, it shines light that they've been camped out at the place so long and they haven't seen change in their life. Listen, it, we should all be growing. But I love you one way or the other. If you choose not to grow, that's between you and Jesus. But don't get mad at people if it doesn't work out. You're like, Pastor, I can't figure out multiplication. Well, you've been in the math class of just uh, addition for the last 50 years. You didn't want to learn multiplication. You see my point? So it's okay to come up to the next level. And when you come up to the next level through instruction, I'm, I'm not your Jesus. I'm not here to control you. My job is to lead and feed. So I'm going to prepare the word that God has placed on my heart, and I'm going to put the spread. And if you want some, come on up to the table and eat all you want. But if you think pastor's going to show up like they do little babies with a little pl- a rubber spoon, and I'm going to scrape that food, and I'm going to chew it up to make sure it's all. Yeah, I've seen moms do that. This is disgusting. I mean, help me, Jesus. And then put it on that spoon and cram it in that baby's mouth, and that baby, pff, and then you wipe it all, and let's try again. And you can do the choo-choo train all you want, and they're going to cram it back in your mouth, and you're like, pff, and you're like no, 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 I'm not going to do that. If you want to spit out the word of God, that's between you and Jesus. I'm, I'm not messing with that stuff. Hello. And sometimes we come out of churches that that's all it was. They were force feeding you everything. And then because it wasn't work, then they found that they they had to control you and manipulate you and browbeat you and tell you what a horrible person you were. We'll just tell you the truth in love. And as much as I love you, I'm not going to lose sleep if you don't do it. Right? Right? I'm on the bus following God. If you want to be, we got a seat for you. But if you don't want to, that's fine between, that's, that's you and Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus stopping ministry because the Pharisees and Sadducees didn't agree with him? Oh, I just can't do this now. I need, them, I need their support. No. No. Why am I saying that? Some of us are waiting for the support of others that might not ever support you before you obey God. You obey God. And if the people in your family, your friends, your neighbors follow you, great. But sometimes you don't need your family, friends, and neighbors to follow you. Sometimes you got to be an Abram to become an Abraham. you got to walk away from some stuff that you know and people that would discourage you from obeying God so that you can do what God tells you to do. Say instruction. Remember Doc Barkley used to say, people take instruction a lot better than they do correction. But sometimes there is correction too. But we come for instruction. I'm looking for God to guide me. And, I, you know, over the years, many years, I guess now, help me, Jesus. Do you know next year Hope Church will be celebrating 60 years of ministry? Wow. Now, before you say anything, I'm not, I didn't start the church, so just don't even look at me that way. But, you know, I've been the senior pastor now, how many years has it been? 20 20, 21 years, been in full-time ministry over 30-something years. But you know what? Part of our rhythm is, is to teach you the Word and encourage you to find the revelation or conviction from that Word by the Spirit of God. I don't want you to live my convictions, because then you're doing it out of effort. I want you to get it from God. And when God shows you what to do, reveals it. If it's giving, tithes and offerings, if it's obeying, if it's praying, if it's, you're not doing it out of obligation, you're doing it out of revelation, which is faith. Then it's your conviction. 
I'm, I just thought years ago, I'm not going to be, you know what I mean, these churches that uh, everything's built on someone controlling you. I'm not going to control you. I have no interest in controlling you. I want you free. Amen. You're not going from the bondage and the prison of sin into the prison of religion. No way. I said no way. So encouragement, love, community, help doing good, uh, meeting together in worship, meeting together for instruction. Next verse, Ephesians 4.16. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. We're the body of Christ. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Amen. Next one. We each have a part. We each have a purpose, like we said earlier. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. See, I have a purpose. Do so, you know, in any church, every person has a purpose. Not everybody's doing something, but they can. We took, I read a book years ago by Tommy Barnett and it said the title of it was The Miracles in the House. And we implemented that principle years ago. And the idea behind the principle was that uh, for, for ministers or pastors or leaders, if you're trying to do something, you need people. You need leadership, you need people volunteering, you need people working. And sometimes you get under the pressure of trying to get the task done, and you don't know who to look to. And so the human tendency, and if you've been in church any length of time, you probably have seen this. And it's, it's what is called in the business world is the 20-80 rule. In business, it's 80% of your business is done by 20% of your customers. In the church world, it's still a similar thing, and it's typically that 80% 80 of ministry is done by 20% of the membership. Now, part of that is not because the other 80% of the church are clueless. Part of it, the responsibility falls on leadership. Because it's easy to go to someone who's, who's doing great and excited about ministry and volunteering or willing to do something and say, hey, I know you're doing two things. Do you mind adding one to it? But if you're not caref careful, we go back to that well and go back to that well. And one day you wake up and have you ever been to a church and all of a sudden you weren't doing one thing. You weren't doing two things. You weren't doing three things. You're doing 33 things. And you're like, help me, Jesus. Now, you know, I mean, now you're so overwhelmed with church and ministry that, you know, I mean, vacation for you is not to hear or think about it. Yeah. Nobody's ever had that happen. And there can be overabuse and use in the church because of leadership. Not, all they do is they go by what they know, and they only know a few to work, and so they put everything on the few that are willing to work. But we, we began to implement the process years ago, and that principle, again, is the miracles in the house. So if there's a need, God's already brought the person. Yes. Now we got to develop out of relationship an opportunity and say, hey, we're, we're doing this. And look for, through, re, through relationship and opportunity, for people to rise up and be part. Because if you're sitting here and you're like, and again, Hope Church, we, we give you what we call, jokingly but seriously, uh, the opportunity to hang out and hide out, Right? We give our guests, we're not going to draw attention to you, we're not going to have you stand up, we're not going to sing to you, as some churches do. I'm not going to have people turn around and try to pressure you by handshake and say, let's join the church, come out of the front. We don't do that. If I have to high pressure sales you, sell you to join the church or get saved, something's wrong. So I give people freedom. Hang out, hide out. But some people have hung, like we saw a couple weeks ago, see it was hanging out and hiding out for nine years. That's a long time to hang out and hide out. You know, what happens is sometimes we, we miss out on the benefits of being a part of something. Yes. Being a part of something greater than ourselves. Being a part of a team, a community that's making a difference. Being a part of something that on surface doesn't look like it's benefiting all, us at all, but it's benefiting other people. And if your only perspective of church is what you can get out of it, you're going to miss the greatest value of what you can get out of it. Let me say that again. If your perspective when you walk into a church is to find out what you can get out of it, you're going to miss the greatest value of what you can get out of it. Because the greatest value of what you get out of a church is just not what you hear or see or clap to, but also what you're a part of. Because when you begin to become a part of something greater than yourself, you're building relationships, encouragement, community, and, and making a difference. In fact, Jesus said it this way. Anyone who gives or lays their life down for me and the gospel's sake... He could have stopped and said, just for me. But he said, and the gospel's sake. 
That's getting the gospel, the good news out to people. Anybody who lays their life down, their wishes, their wants, their needs, their desires, anybody who takes their self and puts it on the back burner and makes getting, being a part of getting the gospel out a priority, he said, to them, they will find true life. A quality of life they didn't realize before. So I go back to that last comment. If you walk into a church only to see what you can get out of it, you will miss out on the greatest thing you can get out of it. Because it's just not in strolling in and strolling out, but being a pillar, a part of what God is doing. In your giftedness, in your giftedness. We don't want you to work in the nursery if you're not passionate about children. And some of you are like, whoo. And some of us have been a part of churches and around ministries that, hey, you had to work. All you have to do is say, I'd like to do something. And they throw you in the greatest need. No, we don't put you in the greatest need. We find your gift set. Your gift. What does your gift say? Because churches that do it the other way, you know what they end up having over the process of years later? They'll have people on the platform singing that can't carry a tune but love children. And they'll have people that are amazing singers in the nursery but, and don't like kids. And they can't figure out why things aren't working for them. You have a gift. Your purpose. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. That's your opportunity. Your special opportunity. Your work. Well, let somebody else do it. They might be able to do it, but if God's called you to do it, it's specially tied to you. Number eight. You didn't know. I've never done so many points in one time. Only 30 more to go. Just lighten up. We're almost done. Quit looking at your watch. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps. It helps the other parts. It benefits other people. Community benefits other people. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So the whole body, that's partnership. Say partnership. partnership. You're not an island to yourself. You're part of something bigger than yourself. Healthy and growing and full of love. Healthy and growing and full of love. Who doesn't want that? But you notice that the benefit that comes to you, healthy and growing and full of love, is at the end of the process and not the starting lineup. It's not the first thing on the list. It's the last thing on the list. Because most people listen to me in their life never make it to the end of the list. Because they only start at the first top of the list and then they quit. Because they don't see what they really want that's in there. But God says, I'm going to put it at the last of the list. God will say, I'm going to bless you. I want that. And I want you to start being a blessing before I bless you and obey me. I don't want that. And they never make it to the last of the list because they start, stop at the first of the list. Yes, I want a great marriage. Well, I want you to begin to invest in your partner. I don't want to do that. They should be doing it for me. And they don't get the, what's on the last of the list because they can't obey what's on the first of the right. list. Right. Listen, if, you, if it all made sense when you started, then there'd be no need for trust. And the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. He'll ask you to do stuff, and you don't have to copy somebody, just let him show you. But he'll ask you to do something on the first of the list. And he knows that if you obey him, you'll get what you really want, but it's on the last of the list. It doesn't mean you're the least important. He's wanting to see if you'll obey him. Because it's in the obedience you allow him to empower you to have all those things you're really looking for. I found a great solution years ago. I had people, Pastor, we should do this. We need this ministry. You need to make that happen, Pastor. I'm not going to make it happen. It's not what God called me to do. Do you want to do it? Oh, no, no. But I've seen it work. It'd be great. I'd like to go to it. Mm -hmm. We we want the results, but we don't want the effort. We all would love to be in shape. But our memberships, we don't know where that's at anymore. We don't even forget We all want a great marriage. We all want to be financially blessed. But it doesn't, it doesn't happen because you sit there saying, kumbaya, Lord. Right. Let it drop in my hands. If that happened, it would be doing it for everybody. It's your choice to pursue God by faith. 
Because that's, that's how we receive from him. And when he begins to show you what to do, it might not look what you're asking for. The Bible in the Old Testament, I'm ending with this verse. The Bible in the Old Testament says, pray to God for rain. Pray, for, pray to God for rain in the time of the latter rain. Pray to God for rain. It was a practical prayer because they needed rain for the harvest. Pray to God for rain in the day of the latter rain. And it says, and he will send a cloud. I remember that. I got a revelation in that. Because when I'm praying for rain, guess what I want? I want rain. And if you're sitting a sunny day praying for rain, and all of a sudden it gets cloudy, have you ever complained about the clouds? Lord, oh, I need my vitamin D, Jesus. I like it when it's sunny. Yeah, but you've been praying for rain. I, I know, I, I want rain. Well, I'm sending clouds. I don't need clouds, I need rain. I'm sending what will produce what you're asking for. God, God's interesting that way. You'll pray for blessing and he'll give you an opportunity. Maybe an opportunity for uh, overtime. I don't need overtime. I need more money. <laughs> Gone to my mailbox five times and nothing's been there. Or maybe he'll give you an opportunity to sow into somebody else's life. I don't need to sow into somebody else's life. I need somebody to sow into my life. I mean, not deceive. God does not mock when a man sows, he shall reap. God creates what creates the opportunity and brings a solution. You pray for rain, he sends the clouds. You pray for community, he, he opens Hope Church. You pray for encouragement, he gives you opportunities. You want to be part of something bigger than yourself. I just want someone to make me feel better. Start feel, making other people feel better. And you'll walk away with the benefit of all that God's bringing into your life. Amen? What am I saying? I love how Ephesians, which these are... These epistles are letters written to the church, and they're so practical. The church has to be more than I go when I'm in a crisis need, or I go when my schedule allows, or I just show up on Sunday and I don't think about it again. No, it's not just a service. It's a community. Amen. It's a community. It's a community yes. of believers that come together in relationship. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 We're done. Give the Lord a hand, cl hand clap for you. If you bow your head and close your eyes if you're here today and do not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer. Let it come from your heart. Go ahead and answer that phone. Tell them I said hi. <laughs> Just FYI, mute your phone when you come to church. Salvation is real. I'm not asking if you know about God. I'm asking, is Jesus real to you in the way that you process, experience, and think that you know for yourself that he's real and your Lord and Savior? Only you could answer that. Because I'm telling you, if you don't and you're trying to serve God without that, it's impossible. It's exhausting. But when Jesus is real, and you know he's real and he's your Lord and Savior, it's from that you have life. Your sins are forgiven. The weight, the bondage, the condemnation of sin is gone. The reality of his presence. You know that you're going to heaven. Go ahead and answer the phone again. Please turn it off. You know that you're going to heaven. It comes out of a relationship. It comes out of a relationship. So I'm going to pray this prayer. Let this prayer come from your heart. If that's you and you're like, Pastor, I don't know Jesus in a real and personal way. Maybe you've tried to do the religious thing. That's not going to produce anything on the inside of you. Or maybe you used to have a relationship with the Lord and you say, Pastor, I used to be right with God, but for whatever reason, I've allowed stuff to come between me and God and my heart's not right. If either one of those are you, and right now you feel the tapping of the Holy Spirit on your heart to make things right, this is your time. This is your moment. I want us to pray this prayer together. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Say with me. Heavenly Father, I repent of all my sins. I turn to you today. I believe in my heart, and I confess with my mouth 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came to this earth in the flesh, died on a cross for my sins, was buried for me, and on the third day rose again for me. Because I believe that, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, wash me in your blood, forgive me, cleanse me, give me a fresh start. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Shout amen, church. Amen. 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 Listen, we love you. We want you to know that food pantry, the, uh, the clothing store, department store is going to be open 15 minutes after the service closed. No rush for that. Also, don't forget, invite someone. Be part of the miracle of reaching out and help somebody. We are in an interesting time in the world. And now they're talking about Delta and other variants and all the panic. And people are in fear. Well, you know what they need? They need Jesus. Amen. They need hope. Amen. They don't need to think. They need to not be tormented by the enemy. Right. Amen. Amen. So this is a great opportunity to let your light shine and invite somebody to church. Just be open. Let the Lord create the opportunity. Tag them uh, with the wristband. Invite them to church. Let's, let's be active to reaching people. For the kingdom of God, for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Last but not least, uh, let me uh, speak this blessing over you. For those who are online, thank you for joining us. We encourage you to follow and subscribe, like and share. Are you ready for the blessing? Out of Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody shouted. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a great week. You're dismissed in Jesus' mighty name.